this is Doug Fletcher, and you are listening to What's the Hazard? Uh, it is Friday, February 11th. Um, hope you had a good week. I had a decent week this week. Not bad. Um, I know when I say that, some of you had shitty weeks, and uh, I hope they get better. And um, You know, we were just talking about this, uh, you, me, and Tom, yesterday about uh, what, what poor is. Yeah. And uh, we, we have a mutual friend who yeah. is less than poor. Right. Not less than poor. Not exactly poor, right? Exactly. Just bought up a couple of cars. And, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. But then you made the comment, you know, people look at us and, and like, man, I wish I was in their position. Sure. And we were sitting there going, we're poor as hell. Yeah, we look at ourselves <laughs> as like dirt farmers. and uh, But 98% of the world would look at us, you know, with some yeah. level of economic envy probably, you know. Yeah. It is all relative. And it's like having a good week is relative too. I know that in our world, in this safety leadership world, um, having a bad week can be really shitty. You know, if someone were to be injured or killed on a job site or something, that makes for a bad week, man. And uh, so when I say I hope you had a good week, I do hope you had a good week. But just I guess what I'm really saying is you're not alone. You know, we are kind of sharing in this experience, hopefully. So Uh, and I hope it's Super Bowl weekend. It's Valentine's Day. This is a it's a big weekend. It's a big pressure packed weekend. I was literally just talking to somebody and I made the comment. I was like, man, I wish I didn't have to work Monday morning. Mm-hmm. After and, the Super Bowl, and he goes, Super Bowl should be on Saturday. End of discussion. Yes, <laughs> I completely agree. They've been screwing us with this for <laughs> you know years. I mean? you know, we and I remember pre-COVID, we used to actually get together for Super Bowl parties. I have a buddy right. who would put on a great party. I hope he's listening, and he would put on a really good party, and we'd all get together and we'd have a great time. We'd eat, drink, watch the game, play those little betting games right, that you right. play in that group. And we haven't done that for a few years, and. Uh, I, I would always have that um, Monday morning regret. Well, part of it's like, you know, 9, 10 o'clock rolls around, you're like, shit, I got to get up. I know. I need to cut this yeah. off. The game's not <laughs> over, and you're thinking about leaving, you know? That's terrible. I swear somebody told me that the city of uh, Cincinnati uh, gave the day off from school on Monday. Is I that right? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, that sounds cool. Everybody should shut down on the Monday after the Super Especially Bowl. Especially if your city's in the Super Bowl. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. And... Your team. I, I guess with uh, with uh, Valentine's Day that Monday, they're going to be millions of guys hitting the uh, Hallmark <laughs> card store on Monday, hungover, trying to find that card in well, the I last mean, minute. Well, I mean, they're probably, it's this weekend, right? This weekend, the restaurants will get the rush. Oh, yeah, man. And, uh, it's, yeah, it's crazy. Well, anyway, as you all know, my guest is Aaron Cerrone, my pal, uh, our leadership expert. And uh, we were talking the other day about communication frontline supervisors got a lot of topics um there's there's so many things that we can discuss that have to do with leadership effective leadership and how that impacts working safely which is really the uh you know the finer point of what we discuss Mm -hmm. um anything on your mind i got one thing on my mind i wanted to share with you but i'm going to open it up to you yeah i mean you and i were just talking uh right before we started that you know both of us having worked in the government, uh, fully understand the nuances of, of how leadership and the government works and mm-hmm. and how promotions work and mm-hmm. moving around in there. And, and, you know, government works unique in that uh, the promotion systems are, are very vague at best. Mm-hmm. And uh, you get, you get in like this one page evaluation, it gets turned in and then you hope and pray for the best. And mm-hmm. uh, you, there's not a lot on there. Right. Um, and I just had an experience literally just a couple of days ago where um, leadership changes a lot in the government, uh, especially in the military. They rotate every two to three years. So there's constant reorgs going on and your leadership chain or chain of command is always changing. And that just recently happened to me and it happens every couple of years. So what happens a lot of times, me being a reservist, not there in front of people all the time, mm-hmm. you kind of get lost in the weeds. Sure. And uh, I, I often have leadership signing my evaluations who've never met me uh, couldn't pull me out of a lineup to save their kids lives and I just had an experience where I knew a promotion board was coming up and I knew I wasn't going to get the promotion for various reasons there's there's a lot of reasons why things work out the way they do and um, I get this message from a peer of mine saying my newest supervisor really wants to talk to me really wants to talk to me I've never met the person in my life and I finally get a hold of him, and all he wanted to tell me was I wasn't getting promoted. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking to myself, A, 
that's a shitty first conversation mm-hmm. to have with someone. Your first conversation you're ever having with one of your subordinates or one of your yeah. employees is to be like, yeah, ridiculous. hey, you're not getting promoted. Hey, thanks, buddy. Good morning to you, too. <laughs> you know, I was like, wh- wh- why would you let that be your lead off? Yeah. Um, you know, I don't delay it three weeks before you have the conversation, but at least talk to me about something before that's your first I mean, thing coming you out of the gate. To meet this guy at any point, will you guys be um, in, on base at the same time? It's, it's hard because I usually work on weekends there, mm-hmm. and him being in the front office, that place is loaded heavily during the week, as mm-hmm. you know, most governors mm-hmm. during the week. Yeah, so he would have to come in to meet me, which hey, shocker, that's yeah. what a good leader would right. do, right? Exactly, <laughs> but um, so. Uh, it was kind of funny, and then in the conversation, the comment was made that, hey, uh, I just want to let you know that the board's, the results are coming out, and you're not on it. Uh, I just wanted to call and, and give it a personal touch. The The fact that you're actually having to say those words, mm-hmm. you're reaffirming in your head right. why you're doing this, yeah. and, and, and you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for me. Like You're doing it just to be able to say, hey, I called Aaron, and, and I gave it the personal touch and did what good leaders mm-hmm. should do. And I'm like, dude. Didn't send him the thin envelope. I'm like, I actually yeah, called I him. mean, like, I would have rather you have done that because I knew it was coming anyway. And I made the comment, well, you didn't need to waste your time. I knew it was coming. And he goes, oh, uh, this was expected. Had you looked at my file, mm-hmm. it had clearly seen what, what rating that your organization gave me and yeah. known it wasn't going to be fit for promotion, right? Yeah. So, um, and, and a lot of times the promotion is there's percentages they have to play and they can only let so many people get, depending on the year, get promoted and, and what position you're actually in if there's even an open spot. There's lots of there's lots of moving mm-hmm. parts to this. But I'm like, dude, had you looked at my file for 10 seconds, you would have seen that it was clear it wasn't going to happen and I would have already known this. So not only did you not know me, and did this for yourself. You didn't even take the time to look anything up about me before you called me for the first time ever. Mm-hmm. That's so, interesting. So I'm just like, let's, I'm like foul, foul, foul. And and I didn't even need the phone call to be honest. Like I've been I've been in the military 25 years. I know how it works. You, you know what's coming and what's mm-hmm. not coming. That's not the big deal. I wasn't expecting uh, the promotion that had really nothing to do. That was water under the bridge already. But the the phone call that bothered me more than mm-hmm. anything because I'm like, dude, we've never met. You've never had a single conversation with me, and, and this is how you're leading out. Mm-hmm. And as you recognized, it was more for him to be able to consult it's himself totally, about being a good leader 100%. rather than any and interest in you. There's no convincing me otherwise because yeah. if you really did have true concern, one, you would have met me months ago. You would, you'd have gone out of your way. Mm-hmm. To, to, I work in your command center, for God's sake. Yeah. Right? I'm, the, I'm the, your chief of operations in your command center. You would think you would yeah. take five minutes to walk down the hall. I don't care how busy you are. Hey, I got to take five minutes to meet this reservist he's in today. Right. No one's going to argue with you about that. I mean, this, right. is, this is a huge leadership concept across the board, man. I mean, I know you and I have s- special experience with this in the government. And government right. performance appraisals, as anyone who has ever are been appraised by the government, to are garbage. The <laughs> yeah. <laughs> say, that's being kind. I, it is that being garbage. kind. I can remember, you know, we had to fill out our own appraisals. I think you and I were talking about this. So when it came around to annual appraisal time, I think we had maybe four elements or something we had to address, and we would be given the form, a blank form with the four elements, and I had to fill in what I had done during the previous year, give it to my boss so he could read and see what I had done during the previous year, and then based on, I'm sure, a preconceived list, who was going to get the exceeds, the meets, or the does not meet, and I think... You know, there was a bonus associated with this. So in in the OSHA office in particular, we would all sit around and and try to guess who's going to get the exceeds this year because the exceeds got the bonus, right? Right. And if you got meets, hey, you you had a job. We used to say, if you meets, you eats, you know? (laughs) So, which, you know, which was kind of like saying, oh, it's okay to, you know, retire at that level, Aaron. Yeah. You know, it's the same condescending bullshit you know but sure you know but we would sit around and try to guess who was going to get the exceeds this year and i get i probably turned in the same performance appraisal every year for five or six years just didn't even change it i did that and most recently because you get to a point you know, in your career yeah, where you're just jaded you're and the writing's the on the thing. wall 
And I literally did a cut and paste from the year before, and nobody said a word to me. Yeah. Which tells me they're not even reading it. <laughs> not even I'm reading it. Like, I just did it just to see what would happen. Yeah. Uh, I, I was actually hoping to get yelled at. Mm-hmm. Then I knew they read it. At least they no read it. No one said a word. No Isn't one said a word. Somebody up there, you know, some uh, some exec, some assistant, probably wordsmithed a few things on mm-hmm. it. Happy to glad changes. Mm-hmm. And then they signed it and sent yeah. it off. <laughs> so it's it like, you're not even reading this it stuff. It was really frustrating. I remember we had a guy in the office, Jim Lightfoot. He retired from the Air Force. In fact, he spent 25, 30 years in the Air Force or something, retired, and then wanted to do a little bit more time in the government. So he came to work at OSHA. Uh, good guy. I really enjoyed Jimmy. But he was the guy that uh, at appraisal time, he would sit down with his team leader. The team leader would start to read his comments about Jimmy's performance. He'd slide it over for Jimmy to sign it. Jimmy would tear it up and throw it in the trash because he didn't give a shit about the performance appraisal. It didn't matter. The team leader would panic because the team leader was required to get a signature from the employee, then sign it, and then turn it into the regional office. Say he made a firm contact with everybody. Yeah, we had our sit down, and we discussed, (laughs) you know, opportunities for improvement or whatever, and Jimmy would always just throw it in the trash, and it just used to drive them crazy because he didn't care. And, um, well, and, th- and that's dangerous. I think that at the end of the day, that that's really the moral of the story here is that when you don't do the things you should do as a leader, people will not care anymore. Well, that's what you get. Yeah. And you get what you put into it. And then you wonder why, oh, Doug just shows up and does his job and leaves. Doesn't seem like he cares. Mm-hmm. Well, no shit. Cause you yeah. didn't care about him for 10 years. Yeah. Do you think, right? You just went through the motions and it was obvious you were just going through the motions. You didn't actually put any thought into that contact you made with him. You didn't put any thought into the conversation. You just checked the boxes so you can turn around and tell your boss, yep, I made positive contact with everybody, and they're all in the know. Right. Okay, good job. Yeah, they all understand, and they're all all in agreement. (laughs) They signed it, so we must have agreed with my appraisal. It is interesting, man. Do do they do that in the private sector? Oh. I mean, I actually only worked in the private sector for a short time. 100%. I think it's more on the radar now uh, to have real conversations and actual relationships mm-hmm. with your uh, employees. I think that's a generational thing. Like we have a generation of, of a workforce who crave more communication than not. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, when we grew up, it was just leave me alone, let me do my work. Mm-hmm. And if you didn't talk to somebody, that meant they didn't need anything, which was right. a good thing. Yeah. Now it's almost the opposite is that we have a we have a generation of workforce where they're worried if you're not talking to them. Mm-hmm. That means something. Sure. So, you know, the expectation has changed a lot as far mm-hmm. as communication. And if you're not communicating, you're going to lose them really quick. Yeah. That's interesting because um, that's interesting you say that because that was absolutely how I looked at it. If I wasn't being yelled at, if it was quiet, no communication, things were going smoothly. Things were fine. Things yeah. were going well. And just and uh, be careful what you wish for. But at, so. the, at the same time, I, I, I didn't want to talk to my boss. Just right. leave me alone. Let me do my work. Right. If you're in my chili, I'm not doing Mark. Uh, if I need something, I'll let you know. Right. And and now it, it's literally, I would say, 180 out in which you, you have to be checking in. Hey, how you doing? Do you need anything? Uh, come talk to me anytime. Uh, do those regular check-ins constantly mm-hmm. because they crave that community. They, being the workforce, crave that communication now more than ever. And if you're not talking to them, and I don't want to say micromanage, but it almost feels on the level, like you're creeping on micromanagement, Mm -hmm. you're not telling them how to do work or what to do, but you're there. You're always checking in. And they know you're there and you're always checking in. And and that's the Mm -hmm. standard now. Interesting. So when we think about, I mean, we were just talking about retention. Mm -hmm. Andy Bassett and I had a little discussion about retention last week with the Mm -hmm. Encore Safety Network. And that sounds like something that would be really important for, from a retention standpoint for this new generation of workers. 100%. They want, they crave that type of communication. 100%. I have a friend of mine who uh, is still in the military, and, and he is commanding a, uh, um, not a logistics group, a, uh, 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 it's part of a flight wing where they do mm-hmm. all the, uh, the ma- maintenance group. It's a okay. maintenance group. He's okay. a commander of a maintenance group. And he's got uh, all... All ages, uh, young generation, older generation, older reservists, everything. And we were talking. He's like, Aaron, it's so crazy right now. It's it's such a dichotomy that I got this older generation of people still working. And if I talk to them, they're like, why are you talking to me? What's wrong? And and so I can, I can leave them go. And they don't want to 
they don't want to talk to me. I don't need to talk to them. They just do their thing. If they need something, let me know. And he goes, and it's just the opposite. I got this younger group of people who freak out if I don't talk to them. Right. Right. So, I, so it's like two completely leadership styles that I have to be able to do because they get stressed if I don't talk to them. They get stressed if I do talk yeah. to them. That's really interesting, man. I mean, it's hard to be a leader right now. I mean, is it harder to be a leader now than it was 20 years ago? I think when? 100% because you have a wider range in age of people. Mm-hmm. You have more different generations with different upbringings all mingling in the workforce at the same time. People are working later yeah. in life. If you think about it, some of the boomers and their children, uh, no one expect them to, to still be working at this point. Right. That's and and they are. So now that's coming together in the workforce. And then you had the millennials, which was the largest workforce population wise ever to enter in the workforce. Mm-hmm. So there's a, a lot. And then you have like my generation, Gen, Gen X stuck in the middle, mm-hmm. you know, am I part of the greatest of generation? What am I? I, I don't, don't know what I, I am. I, I, I was born I, in 59. So what does that make me? You'd be a boomer, right? Boomer. Maybe. I don't know. Something like that, probably. Boomers but, are children of World War II. Okay. That's that era. Yeah, in that era. I mean, my parents were born in the 30s, I think, something like that. Yeah, so you maybe a little after the boomers. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, but I don't so, like so, to be talked to, I can so tell you that. You ha- and then, of course, we're more multiculturally diverse than ever. So there's a lot going on in the workforce right mm-hmm. now. And, uh, and and it takes a lot of different leadership sizes. you got to be very flexible. It makes it very difficult. Very to flexible. I see, you know, I can definitely, um, I can see that. You know, particularly in the workplaces that I go into where they are manufacturing, their construction, those types of, and that's not to suggest that those employees are unique in any, you know, in their needs necessarily, but they are the but workforce. they are. The workforce is interesting, though. The, the composition of the workforce, as you described, you've got 70-year-old guys working beside 20-year-old guys and gals. I don't, you know. Right. And um, that creates some very difficult they're doing the same work but they have different needs yeah and and environment has a lot to do with it you know we were talking about um i don't know if anybody here watching west side barbell Mm -hmm. uh good documentary west side versus Mm -hmm. the world yeah it's great documentary uh but uh doug was there Mm -hmm. in the beginning before it was even west side yeah but we were talking about louis simmons the guy who's known Mm -hmm. for west side started west side yeah and his leadership style and, and the type mm-hmm. of person he was, mm-hmm. and it worked for that environment. You know, you, ha- you have an environment that's very rough around the edges, mm-hmm. a lot of guys on different cocktails of chemicals. Right, man. Oh, yeah. And, uh, there was a lot of volatility. The, the sole goal was who can lift the most weight, mm-hmm. and that was the only goal of the place. Mm-hmm. So the persona developed around that, and then, of course, the leadership will feed mm-hmm. into that and develop that and encourage that. So, you know, you got a guy who clearly got results yeah. i mean they were how many world champions came out of that place to this day they have world records yeah. all over the place the strongest mm-hmm. people in the world have come out of there um and his leadership style allowed that and yeah. created that could he go in the corporate world and lead like that absolutely hell no you know yeah. you, you can't kind of you can't the, they're kind of right. in the corporate world now you know they're selling stuff sure i mean i think just this, it's a lot different than the it necessity was. to make money but you know mm-hmm. you can't come in like he would be able to into a weight room and get your effing butt on that bench and lift that right. god darn weight well, and yada 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 yada. There was very and little positive do it, for us, right? And you, like, you suck, go get it better, right? right? You, you just, right. but it worked for that environment, right, right. wrong, it or did. indifferent. Well, in part because, for one thing, Louis um, led by example. I mean, he was a, an incredibly strong dude. I think he was an elite lifter in five different weight classes or something. In five generations. In five generations. I mean, he, he was <laughs> right. a, a freak of nature. And so, to some degree, you know, he led by example. People respected that he was strong. I mean, I don't recall, and, you know, I wasn't strong enough to lift for Louis. I lifted with the women that lifted for Louis, if you can imagine that. But, right. so Mariah Liggett, who was one of my training partners at the time, was a 15-time world champion. So Louie would communicate with Mariah what he wanted us to be doing, and I was just along for the ride. So she was training with the other women. So Laura Dodd, Deborah Sorensen, Mariah Liggett, Which, Dora Simmons. To put in perspective, everybody watching this, all these women are stronger than any man you know. Oh, yes. Without question. <laughs> like, they were stronger than any I man that I, it, yes. Yeah, so let's, I don't want to b- belittle you by saying I was oh, looking no, with man. the women. Oh, no, like, we're, we're talking elite 
power lifters. Strongest women on the planet. On the planet. Yeah, strongest yes. women on the planet, which was remarkable. But again, Louis never, he was not a rah-rah guy, you know. If you were not doing it, he was quick to call you a pussy. But sure. if you did it right, that was what was expected. Sure. And that's kind of a generational thing. I think, you know, Louis was, uh, had been in the military. He'd been a, worked on, I think he was a crane operator at one point when he started. Sure. You know, we were lifting in the garage. Pra- praise the wasn't a necessity. It you wasn't, were expected to perform. And I don't remember my father ever praising anything. I mean, that was a generational thing. You yeah. know, there were two things. There were silence or criticism. <laughs> you right. know, and yeah. silence was good. Criticism was like, well, I better get my shit together. Yeah. Right. And, I and think that is definitely generational, and that's you know that's a that's a, a transition that the workforce has made and needed to make. Mm-hmm, so let's be mm-hmm. honest. I, I think praise absolutely no no one can argue praise isn't necessary. You need to praise people now, not to the point where you're praising every little and you know and then the pendulum always swings hard mm-hmm. where you're praising every little. Hey, thanks for coming today. <laughs> right. Well, I hired right. you to work. I would yeah. think that's a basic Thanks expectation. Thanks for being here on time today. Right. You know, but the, but it, it does swing hard. So, you know, the truth is always somewhere in the middle, you know, and it comes back to do you do you praise results or do you praise effort? Mm-hmm. So, like, in, in the environment of Westside Barbell, Louie didn't praise effort. Effort made It was just yeah. results. Because who cares that yeah. you tried, you didn't get the lift. Right. And in that environment, that makes sense. That was it. Either you did it or you didn't. No one cares if you missed it. Mm-hmm. Oh, good try. You mm-hmm. missed it. You trained really hard and bombed out at the meet. Right. You, so you, you know, missed loser. it. So it's all for and But I think that's unique to sports, right? That That yeah. is a sport. Uh, but there's a translation to corporate, right? And, and leadership in, in organizations, it's you have to be very careful praising effort because, oh, well, you tried. I'm glad you tried. Good job. You tried. But the problem is I'm not paying you to try. Mm-hmm. That's a great at the point. end of the day, I'm paying for results. Like the organization has to be productive. That's a great point. To survive. It's mm-hmm. business. So when you get in a habit of praising effort too much, well, as long as I tried, I'll have a job and I'll keep getting bonuses. So you can really jade a workforce because you got somebody, let's say you're producing, but I keep getting praised for trying really hard. And you're like, but I made the sale and he didn't even make the sale. That's a good point. Why is he getting all this praise? Right. Or why are we getting equal praise? I'm the one actually giving results and producing. Right. Good job. You're trying. Because after a while, trying hard doesn't really do anything. If we're being honest with yourself, mm-hmm. somebody who's trying hard and not producing, they're failing. Yeah. We don't like to say that. Wow. But at the end of the day, they're failing. You go to the meet, you didn't get the lift, you failed. Right. I know you tried hard. You had 500 pounds on your chest. You're trying like hell to move that thing, mm-hmm. but you didn't move it. You failed. Right. Now, am I supposed to praise you as much as the guy that did get the lift? Am I supposed to praise you as much as a girl that did make the sale or did close the deal? That's it. And if you had a if you had a company full of people that were trying really hard and couldn't get it done, you're going to close. You would close. <laughs> right. You're done. Hey, everybody tried point, real hard. Man. man, what a great leader! He got everybody to try really hard. Nobody made a single sale. Mm-hmm. Nobody signed a single contract. We are closing our doors. Man, that's true. You know, yeah. so, so results do matter. Yeah. You know, we get, you know, this whole, you know, winning isn't everything. It, it's not, but for a business or organization to survive, you do have to win. Yes. You do have to make sales. You do have to close contracts. You do have to get work done. You do have to be productive. Yeah. Work needs to get done. Trying is great. I get it. And you do want to praise effort to some degree. But at the end of the day, it, it there needs to be a transition mm-hmm. where you have to go, I know you're trying hard, but I need results. Mm-hmm. Now, the good leader says, what can we do to help you to get these results? What training do you need? What tools do you need? What support do you need? And after you've given all that and the results still aren't coming, now the decision needs to be made. Right. That's a good point, too. I think oftentimes... Um, when we don't get the results we want, we've got, we see effort. There, there's something flawed in the system. Maybe we, like you said, we didn't give the employees everything they needed to be successful, whether that be training or tools or whatever that is. So we need to revisit perhaps why they're not getting those results when they are putting in the effort. And then, as you said, if we've, all of those boxes have been checked, then maybe it's just not the right fit. Well, or, the, or right person. the person just isn't capable. There's yeah. nothing wrong with saying that. We don't yeah. like to say that. 
Yeah. Oh, you don't want to hurt their feelings. I'm not talking about hurting somebody's feelings, but it's just a real honest conversation that, that is just like, you're not capable of doing it. Mm-hmm. This isn't the job for you. Mm-hmm. Or this isn't a position for you. Now, if you value the person, if they bring other intangibles to the table, you may want to try to find them and put them in another place in a company where they could be productive and could get results, but it's just not this particular yeah. position. That is tough, though. Right. Man. But fitting, I mean, to some degree, that has to do with, well, maybe not, I, giving people the opportunity to do things that they enjoy. I've read those. I don't know if it's Stephen Covey or whomever put this together, those list of things, you know, the 10 things that give satisfaction to employees. And it's like every day I get to do something that I really enjoy or whatever that, you know know what I'm talking about? Which is important. It's your passion, right? Do, Mm -hmm. you know, find what you're passionate about and do it. And you always hear like every year, um, uh, Warren Buffett comes and talks to UNO and his buddy Bill Gates come mm-hmm, in and mm-hmm. I jokingly call him Uncle Warren, right? <laughs> right. And, but every year they do, every couple of years they do their talk and there's always one kid in the back at the end. Are there any questions? What's your advice to a new graduate? And they always say, do what you're passionate about, mm-hmm. right? Do what you like. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean you're good at it. Right, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're good at it at all. I was a passionate all. basketball player. It doesn't stuff. mean I should pay you to do it because you're just not good at it. You love doing it. You got to remember what passion is. Passion is an activity or something you'll do, and you're so in the zone. It's just the love and the joy of doing it. You don't mm-hmm. care about the results. You'll just That's do it point. for hours on end because the love of the process Okay, that doesn't mean you're any good at it. Right. <laughs> that doesn't mean you should open a business doing it. That doesn't mean somebody should hire you to do it. Right. That's so, a great point so when too. you say, "Hey, get him, get your employees to do things that they like doing," well, you have to be careful there because they like doing a lot of things, but doesn't mean that's the best for the company. Right. That's doesn't mean that's where they're too, most man. productive by any stretch of the imagination. Right. So right. You, you might have a talent. You know, they call it. Um, your zone of incompetence, your zone of competence, and your zone of genius. Mm-hmm. So your zone of incompetence is when you're doing things that you have no business doing. You, you just, you suck at it. You're not yeah. good at it. Yeah. You're out of, you're, you're getting out of your wheelhouse. Your zone of competence is something that you're actually good at. You have a talent, but you don't really like doing it. Mm-hmm. Most people, their career is in their zone of, zone of competence. zone of competence. Right? It's something I'm good at. It's a talent I developed. I don't love doing it, but I can get paid a lot of money to do it. Mm-hmm. And I kind of do it just because I need mm-hmm. to eat, right? Right. And that zone of genius is where that passion meets purpose. And you're actually working in something that you're passionate about and really that love doing. At. And you can make money at. And it's where everything comes together. What, is that Very few a, people can meet that zone of genius. Is that a book or something? Where, where did you get that? That's a great concept. I, I, I forget where I, I mean, that's really knows? interesting stuff. We're all stealing stuff, stuff from somebody oh, at yeah. this point, right? But I, but I think that is really um, interesting because, you know, those those few people that are working in their zone of genius are really really achievers, you know, and, sure. and it's not always easy to find that. And I think a lot of people con themselves in thinking they're in their zone of genius. They're really mm-hmm. not like I've, I've had jobs, um, all the time I get contacted by headhunters by no means bragging, but I have a talent in certain areas, mm-hmm. but I turn the job down cause I just don't like doing it. Mm-hmm. I know I'm going to be miserable. I'll be, I'll be mm-hmm. making good money, but I'll be miserable doing it. Yeah. Cause I, cause I just hate the environment. I hate the people. <laughs> Right. Which is bad to say. No, I get that. But I'm good at the work. I can do it yeah. uh, well, but I just don't like it necessarily. Is there a way to find a way to uh, find a way to do that work where you're not in that construct, whatever that is that you dislike? I, I think that's the you goal, can right? Still do the that's work the ultimate in a different goal environment or something. That's the goal. And as a lead, I mean, you think about it. Every time somebody quits a job, what's one of the first things they said? It's not worth the money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, so for the first yeah. things they say it's not worth the money this headache isn't worth the money mm-hmm. uh, i didn't like the environment whatever it happens to be yeah. it's never the work itself i mean it sometimes it is but for the sometimes most part, um but I, I think that's that's always a struggle for everybody driving towards that uh zone of genius but from a leader's perspective one of your jobs should be trying to get your employees into that into zone of that genius, zone. trying to find, trying to always drive them towards that. Yes, they're competent in what they do and they're very good workers. That doesn't mean they enjoy it or they get any fulfillment out of it. Yeah. Right. That's so she should always try to drive them. Now, can you get everybody into that place? I mean, if you're in a packing I house. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, man. If, don't answer that. If you're in a packing house, I mean, how many people really enjoy that work? I get, yeah. I get that. 
Yeah. Um, there's just jobs out there that, I mean, no one, I mean, if you're on a road crew, nobody can, I mean, I guess some people do enjoy it. Uh, yeah. They just, if that's all they've known, they just. Working outdoors they come or to whatever like that is, you know. They like being outside. And, and there's probably other reasons that they're out there than just moving a shovel around. Yeah. And, I mean, even as you describe working in a packing house or something, to some people that would seem like undesirable work, but. If you are in your zone of competence or perhaps even in your zone of genius, I'm just really good at this, whatever that is, that you can certainly find satisfaction from well, that. It could be one of those things where I don't necessarily mind work, but I love the people I'm with. Yes. I love working with my hands. I'm not stuck behind a desk. Uh, they exactly. might truly enjoy it. Yeah. Um, you, you just, as, as a leader, you got you got to find you got to find that niche for people and move them around. You got to be willing to move people around your company, not just well, I hired you for this. This is what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. Um, because it might be a total zone of competence, but the person doesn't like doing it necessarily. Mm -hmm. They took the job because you're going to pay them money mm -hmm. and they need money, but it, they're probably eyes are on something else already mm -hmm. and looking to move. This is why you get a lot of rotation and a lot of turnover in a company is because you hired them for their skill set, but not necessarily putting them in a place where they're going to flourish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. That, I mean, it, this is why I've never been actually a leader. <laughs> I just work by myself because this is really challenging. I mean, to be able to do all these things. We were talking about, you and I were talking about the other day, that oftentimes the, the disconnect is in the frontline supervisor. When we're talking about a safety program in particular, working mm -hmm. safely, you can have executive, the executive level buy-in. They're all in you know, They want their mm -hmm. employees to be safe. They don't want the costs of injuries. And the employees want to be safe. They would certainly want to be able to go home at the end of the day and spend the money that they made in the, in, right. in a fashion that they want to. But the frontline supervisors, the people that you're just describing, have so many, um, they're being pulled in so many different directions that oftentimes that's where we see this disconnect in, in uh, either uh, communicating, you know, our expectations clearly or, or um enforcing those rules or recognizing the good behaviors that you want. I think it's got to be really difficult or to just, do that. Just knowing your people. Just knowing, yeah. Uh, again, you know, your first conversation with somebody shouldn't be, hey, get your hard hat on. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. If that's your first conversation with someone, you're you're probably in a bad spot to begin with. Because now, Because now what's their impression? They're like, this SOB doesn't even know who I am, and here he is telling me to get my hard hat on. Yeah. Doesn't even know my name. That's a great comment. Yeah. You know, so are you really leading at that point mm -hmm. or are you just directing? Yeah. Traffic, well, there is that you know? difference, right? Between leading and managing or leading and directing, 100%. whatever that is. 100%. Yeah. Well, I mean, I used to work for an area director who, in, in my opinion, was not a, a great leader necessarily, but we've had this conversation, got results. Right. You know, got results. It, it, it's hard. I, I see both sides of it. It's hard to argue results it is it's hard to argue the person that can drive the bottom line it's hard to argue the person that can get elite performance out of people mm -hmm. you see it all the time in sports oh he was a tyrannical coach he won 15 national championships mm -hmm. yeah that's what you hired the person to do yeah, he wasn't right. a great people person, and no one really liked him, but he got results. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're going to hire somebody who's nicer to the people, and now you have 10 losing seasons in a row. Mm -hmm. So what, nice what, what do you want? Great guy. Everybody loved him, but you lost all the time. So there, there's a balance, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a critical balance, but you have to ask yourself at the end of the day, what, what do you value? Do you value results, or do you value personality and people there's a play, time and place for both but at the end of the day we know in business if you're not making money you're not going to be in business right. we know in sports if you're not winning you're not going to have your job very long you know in, in case of west side barbell louis was known for getting top performance out mm -hmm. of lifters how he did that probably wouldn't fly very well in, in today's mm -hmm. environment and my understanding he's even toned it back a little bit but he's also getting older and, yeah. and getting out of the game right. but but there was a time, it's like, if you don't want to do it, there's someone right behind you that will. Or if you couldn't do get it. Get out of the way. Yeah, you're out. Exactly. You know, and if, if you had a rising star, somebody that was going to be a world champion, they got the attention. And if you were lagging behind, you were you were done. You were behind. Catch up. it was up. all about results. Right. Get, get on our level or get out. Mm -hmm. 
And that in and of itself is a motivator. If you are the one that is being replaced or lagging. For certain people. For certain people, that might be what yeah. pushes you over the edge. And we know people are motivated by different things, but in that environment, if you weren't motivated by competition, you weren't motivated by someone on your heels, mm -hmm. uh, you weren't going to survive. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and again, I think there's a time and a place for everything. Uh, it, will that work in corporate world? Probably not. In, in a sales in a sales commission based driven type of environment, it probably works a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Either you're selling or you're not. You want the attention. You want to be the top dog. Sell. Mm -hmm. If you're not selling, you're going to get pushed to the side. I understand that. Uh, is it right? You know, it's all in delivery of the mm -hmm. message. It's like, hey, seller, go home. You don't necessarily need to say it like that, but it's it's an understanding. Hey, this is a very competitive environment. It's all commission based sales and results based. So if you're not getting results, the person who is is going to move up ahead of you in the company. It's it's that simple. Right. So you need to understand what you're getting into before you start here. Mm -hmm. I, all, right. all of this information, I'm really conflicted now because, you know, I I actually had some serious animus with this boss of mine. You know, I I really was challenged by his leadership style. In fact, to the point where I openly just didn't like him we just did not get along and it's not that i needed a hug i'm not that guy necessarily i just didn't need you screaming Come on, everybody at me. enjoys a good hug well that, like, <laughs> yeah man okay cam get in here we want to <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> hugging a bear when you yeah, hug that's it like big hairy. <laughs> exactly but you know in retrospect um you know maybe i, I mean as we were just discussing we were one of the highest performing offices in the country. I mean, everybody hated every, there was so much tension that it was almost impossible to maintain, you know, and people would burn out and people would leave. That's what happened to me. I just kind of burned out and left. But during the time that you were there, they tended to get a lot of work out of the people. So I guess that's, I mean, that's maybe that a, a choice that a leader has to make. Am I just going to ride these people till they implode or right? There's a balance too. You got to be careful, right? It, results are important. And, and if you're getting praise for getting results, but if you're burning people out and driving them away, you got to remember those are the ones getting the results for you. And you may be driving off key people, right? And in your head, if you're like, well, it doesn't matter who it is. I'll get results out of them. That's not always true. So somebody like yourself, who could perform in that environment, if you leave, the next person may not be built for that. Yeah. And now performance starts to go down. Because mm -hmm. remember, it's it's performances where the leadership style and the people, like, it, they merge and, and they come together. Like, mm -hmm. your leadership style is getting performance out of those people. It resonates with them. Whether they like it or not, it resonates with them, and they will subsequently perform. Okay, it'll it'll reciprocate. But if this leadership style doesn't match with the right people, you're going to go down in flames. Mm -hmm. So it matches up for a while. But with these people start leaving and the new people coming in aren't of the same mindset, you're going to start to either mm -hmm. level off or now go down because they're not like Doug. Right. They don't have thick skin like Doug. They weren't raised like Doug. They don't just, they won't work hard. They don't, they're not worried about feelings, right? The next person coming in needs the communication, needs the soft skills, very bright and very talented, but can't be told shut up and work. Mm -hmm. And now you have a problem because the leadership style that worked for this group of people, as that wrote, as that turnover happens, the new people come in and it doesn't resonate with. Mm -hmm. Is it important that the people that we promote into those leadership positions are in that zone of genius. I mean, do you promote the best performers? Is that no, necessary? No, I, I, I'm totally in disagreement with that. And I've seen that happen in so many places, especially mm -hmm. the IT world mm -hmm. in the medical community. Well, you're the best programmer, so we should put you in management. No, those are two different skill sets. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the brightest we have. He gets a lot of work done. He's a genius. He's always the first one to get things done. He's always the first one to catch mistakes. That doesn't mean you should lead people. Mm -hmm. Look at the medical community. Who runs hospitals? I don't know, doctors? Or? Surgeons, doctors. Yeah. The top surgeon runs the hospital. Mm -hmm. Why? 
this person spent their whole life becoming a surgeon. What makes them think they can lead an organization all of a sudden? Mm-hmm. They have no experience at the CEO level. But they were generating a lot of, a lot of revenue probably for the hospital. Maybe, so they thought they were the they, person or This whatever. person was a king dingling as mm-hmm. a surgeon. Mm-hmm. So we make them, let them run the hospital. Now they're having to deal with P&L and, and making strategic decisions when they spent the majority of their life developing an expertise mm-hmm. or perfecting that of being a doctor. Mm-hmm. So now we're going to say, well, you're the CEO now. Right. A wholly different skill set yeah. that you've spent no time developing. Yeah. Plus, now you've so, taken out that high performer out of the performance role into this leadership role, but this well, seems to be a very common... I mean, let's take it to a granular. Look, look at a construction company. Does your top framer, is that person, should that person necessarily be a foreman or a supervisor? Not necessarily. Just because they can frame like no other doesn't mean that right. person should run the place. Right. So it, it's specific skill sets that, at the, but at the same time, just because someone's not a good framer doesn't mean they can't run the place. Right. Just because someone's not your best programmer doesn't mean they shouldn't be put in management because they do have the soft skills. They do have the people skills. They do know how to motivate people. They do know how to message properly and communicate clearly and cleanly. And they do know how to change your communication style to resonate with different people. That's who you want in the leadership role. Yeah. That's who you want to manage. So you don't necessarily have to go to the zone of genius to get your next leader. Well, that that might be their zone of genius, mm-hmm. is that they are good with people. Mm-hmm. And that's the role they should be in. Not the best programmer or the best right. framer or the best player. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's think, let's think about this. Look at, look at any sports. Look at the NFL, for example. If by the logic the best person should lead the place... Every coach should be a Hall of Famer. Oh, that's a good point. And none are. Right. Most never even played the game. Right. At a very low level if they did. At best. Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a second. Every sports team should be led by a Hall of Famer. And most, if any, have ever been. Right. Who's the head coach? Someone who's cultivated that skill set of coaching and leading and managing their whole career. They become the, the mm-hmm. are the best candidates for the head coach, not the best player. Mm-hmm. Michael Jordan should be a head coach if that was the case. And it's interesting, right? Yeah, it's interesting that you see so many of these new, really young coaches, particularly like in football. They're younger the, than the, their players. The coordinators, you know, the offensive and defensive coordinators are in children. their early thirties. And there's players older than them in the league. Yeah. So just think about that concept that even the NFL is starting to recognize that you don't have to be a player to be a good coach mm-hmm. and understand how to coach, understand how to design schematics. And, and, and really, the, the head coach is a CEO. You're just leading people at that point. Right. You're not coaching anything anymore. Right. You're leading people. Mm-hmm. You, you don't have to be a good player. Mm-hmm. But I think there must be something to the communication piece that you would want to have these young coaches in those positions of authority when you have 21, 22, 23-year-old players who probably have a difficult time relating to the 65, 70-year-old coaches to some degree. And I think just the opposite is true, too. Let's say I'm a guy that's been in the league 15 years, so I'm pushing 40. Now i got to listen to this 32-year-old who's never played a down in his life. Mm-hmm. So, so there's both sides to yeah. it, right? And, and again, it's, it goes back to communication. It goes back to being able to show why you're in this position, why you've earned it. And a lot of times it's showing your expertise and showing your knowledge, mm-hmm. proving yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay. And a lot of times those guys have known that, that that person who's in their early to mid thirties, who got that position, they've been working their way up through the organization. So sure. they've paid their dues and they've had success. Obviously. And they've had success and people recognize mm-hmm. that. Um, because at that level, it's all about winning anyway. Yeah, winning. It's again. all about winning again. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about performance and productivity. It is ultimately. Well, how are we doing for time, man? Is it time? We're rolling up on time. Man, that goes so by so That's Cam's quick. way of saying I'm bored. We, I'm bored back here. <laughs> no, I was going to go on to another top. I've got about four more subjects here that we haven't even touched on. We can probably hit on one quick. We got five minutes. We got five minutes. We got five minutes. Let's talk a little bit about. I mean, you're paying. We got as long as we want. Uh, well, he has another, he's got a hard <laughs> stop. He's got another client coming in right after us, so we don't want to go Nobody's over. as popular as us. Come on now. <laughs> Is that true? They can wait. Do you have a more popular client coming in after us? <laughs> Is this the guy that does the bowl insemination stuff? <laughs> I know that is very popular. So, anyway, you know what's funny? I, I've gone we'll down for next time, the man. YouTube rabbit hole of 
watching this guy trim hooves mm -hmm. on bulls and cows. I've seen that. It's it's amazing in the most ridiculous way, and I don't know. I, was, I sat there one day for an hour watching this guy just trim hooves. Yeah, <laughs> I, was like, I know, oh. and it looks like it would hurt. It's it's just, some, and then he sees certain things and knows where to go. He's knows where that not stuff to go. out of that hoof, that me. living. Anyway, that we're way down the rabbit hole now. Interesting. <laughs> so um, I'm going to close with. Uh, I don't know. What are we going to close with? Have you watched Reacher yet? I, I haven't. You've been bugging me to watch that. So okay, so. I don't make any money off of this either. <laughs> I don't make much money off of anything that I do, frankly. But on Amazon, there is this new series that just got posted. And it actually got renewed for another season because right. it was probably the most popular Amazon series of all time, apparently. it's And it, was, it started up a week ago Friday. Uh, it is based on the series of books by Lee Child, the author Lee Child, uh, with right. a character named Reacher. The Jack Reacher. Jack books. Reacher is so there's the been character. A few movie, movies there have done. actually been movies. Tom so, Cruise movies, right? Exactly. So those of us that are purists, those of us that have read the books, when they cast Tom Cruise in the role of Jack it's Reacher, we all just shit our pants, man. It was an abomination. <laughs> because in the book, Jack Reacher. Not because it's Tom Cruise, but just because he uh, doesn't. To some degree, the description of Reacher Cruise. doesn't fit Tom Cruise, or right. Tom, vice versa. Right. But um, no disrespect intended, but I think he looks more like you. You know, he's a big, kind of gruff, burly guy. Um, he doesn't put moose in his hair. He's not that guy. You know, he walks around in a t-shirt. <laughs> you just dated yourself by saying moose. Uh, it might be oh, you, man, for that so matter. Funny. But they found a big dude to do the role, and. Um, and, uh, and somebody worked with him a little bit because he throws some decent elbows and stuff in the fight scenes and stuff. So it looks like, you know, at least they had the decency to train him how to fight. Right. You know, Tom Cruise was like elbowing guys in the thighs and stuff. Is that, <laughs> did you ever see, I mean, it's just horrible, you know? So anyway, man, if you haven't watched Reacher, Reacher. Um, I would highly recommend it. Um, the books are fantastic. You know, if, if that's your genre. Sure. I know that's not for everyone. Um, my wife didn't love Probably it. Probably not. Probably you know, not so didn't much. love it. Dude, speaking of moose, uh, I heard the best dad joke. One of the best dad jokes ever. It's a guy walks into a bar and he gets carded, and while pulling out his ID, his blockbuster card falls out. And the bartender goes, "Never mind." <laughs> right. <laughs> I hear you, man. No shit. All right, guys. Thanks, man. It was good. I mean, the time goes by so Always, quickly, dude. and we it's touch fun. on so many important things. Um, yeah, we'll have to just revisit some of these. We'll continue to talk sure. about them, but this leadership piece is such an important piece to everything that we do in, in every aspect of our lives, frankly. And, so, uh, what, April 4th, when was it, April 7th? Where I are we going to be? April, April 7th, you and I are going to be out at the, uh, Nebraska construction safety and health professionals meeting out at round the bend mm -hmm. home of the testicle festival. I'll be, I'll be presenting. You're going to be presenting. I'm going to be trying to con a free lunch out of them. <laughs> And, uh, and then uh, I just think a, just a, just a good group of, uh, construction guys who, yeah, very who understand group. safety is important and get together right. and, and find ways to be better about it. Yeah. We're looking forward to that. I think we've got a guest coming in from the university. We do. We got that, Patty Meglich who mixed. runs our HR, um, curriculum and program there. So she'll be coming in be to uh, give us some HR insights and yeah, how safety works into that. Right. Very good. That'll be All right, guys. Have a great weekend. Enjoy the Super Bowl If that's your thing. Uh, don't forget that Valentine's Day is I'm Monday. I'm a Bengals fan. Yeah, I'm rooting for the Bengals. I'd like Stafford to get one just because he played on a crap team forever. I know. But. It would be hard for me to be disappointed in either quarterback right. winning. Right. I'm not sure I love Los Angeles just as a whole, as a concept. <laughs> that's, that's but, fair. you know, anyway. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Cam. Appreciate it. Later.